fix stuff and skip stuff. Got it. Hey, Gary. I have had. I put it on for a while. And then they won't let me in without it. I will. But so, I'm doing this constantly. It's time. Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God, one day every knee will bow, still Remains for those who gladly teach you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, now is the to worship, come just as you are before your God, come. Willingly we choose to surrender our lives, willingly we please will bow, with all our heart, soul, mind. Strength, we gladly choose you now. Come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time to give your heart. Come, now is who are to. Just as you are before your God, come. Just as you are before your God, Am I good? Okay. The Bush Valley Craft uh, Club is still auctioning their quilt this fall, and uh, they're way behind in revenue. And that revenue supports local area churches like it does every year and the school in Alpine. So contact Jody. Jody, I know you can see me right there. Get your tickets ready. Um, I don't know how much that they are. They're just an, a nominal purchase for such a good cause. Also, we've got uh, visitors in here. 
well, besides the whole congregation <laughs> being visitors. Uh, <laughs> we have a few visitors in here. Uh, let's see, Bob and Phyllis's grandson, Jake. Jake, good to see you. He's going to be around for a few weeks. Yeah, and I know that you're just hating being in Nutrioso as compared to Tucson, right? Yeah, I can tell you're under a lot of stress. Okay. And we're Ka Karen, would you like to introduce your fiancé? And Steve, you're going to retire in February. Is that right? The plan. <laughs> okay. And you guys are getting married next month. Is that right? Oh, that's great. That's absolutely. It's so good to have you here. And so good to see your fiancé here, too. Uh, any other visitors? Don't think so. John, it's good to see you back. And uh, Sean. Sean's up here. Make sure you make John and Sean feel welcome today. And I'm looking around. I think Tom's back there. Good to see you, Tom. All right. Any announcements that need to be made that I haven't covered? Yes, sir. All right, um, I want to thank everybody for the donations that they've provided so far. Um, it's come in so handy. It's, it's wonderful because I usually buy them myself. So, <laughs> But we still need toothbrushes really bad. Um, we need children's and adults. Uh, we need hair ties like um, barrettes and, and things like that. We never get enough of those. Uh, we need brushes, brushes for the girls' hairs and barrettes of all sizes, any amount. And I need 12 washcloths because I didn't buy enough last year. <laughs> and I need four large Band-Aid boxes, 22 pencil sharpeners, scissors. I need 40. Yeah. We, the children's scissors is all we're looking for. Coloring books, I need 10. Glue sticks, 26. Pencil sharpener's 30, and the matchbox like cars. You don't have to be matchbox. It can, box, it can be anything. And Play-Doh and stickers, any amount will do. I mean, if you see something on sale, grab it. Um, you get the five packs. Most of the stuff you can get at the dollar store. That's where I do a lot of my shopping. So, <laughs> But I really appreciate um, on September 11th, the shoebox group are going to be here at the church praying over our church for this year's shoebox um, drive. So I'm, I'm just excited. My, my craft room is getting full. So <laughs> I love it. So thank you all so very much. Yes, Karen. Oh, wonderful. Okay, awesome. And you had other things that you had uh, purchased, correct? No? Okay. Okay, because I thought somebody had told me they were going to purchase crayons and things like that. So that's a different, a different Karen. Okay. All right. Well, that's perfect. Thank you all so very much for your help. All right. And, of course, the shoebox um, Operation Christmas Child is by uh, Samaritan's Purse is what she's referring to, that this church absolutely excels in every October. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, Jody Larson, who's probably watching, um, her number is on the church roster. Find that number and give her a call, and she can clue you in as to how to purchase the quilt raffle, which is in the fall. We're almost in the fall. We're almost there. So, uh, any other announcements before we move on to prayer requests? Jeremy. Okay. It's still not on? Okay, yeah, I just did. Yes. 
Okay. Uh, prayer requests. Let's move on. I've got a couple written down here. The Blair's daughter, Renee, is having gallbladder issues. And for any of you that have ever had those, just, oh my goodness, uh, talk about pain. Um, pray that God will show her which route to take. She has two choices, uh, surgery, which she's trying to avoid, and I don't think anyone in here would blame her for that. And there's a holistic approach, but it takes a year. So, and it takes commitment. And uh, Mary was telling me, if anybody can commit to that and get it done, it's Renee. So just that God would influence her thinking and show her, hey, this is what I want you to do. Okay? Also, uh, Jenny, I wanted to ask you, and I meant to mention this last week, how is your mother doing? Uh, didn't she take a fall like two, three weeks ago? Two weeks. Yeah. Some places are opening up now. Uh, not all places, but some places. Um, myself and Dave Stuckey's friend from Kansas, some of you have met him. His name is Dan Fricker. Big, tall, lanky guy that Dave has known for 44 years. He and I are going to uh, surprise Arizona to see Dave this coming Tuesday and Wednesday. So I would ask, uh, I would ask for your prayers for us because uh, it's going to be a difficult time as we talk to him. Uh, he's very lucid and he's very alert. Cognitive levels are off the charts and he's doing well and his speech is improving, I think. Mark, when did Mark go see him? It was this past week, wasn't it? Yeah. But we've got to uh, go over some things with him that's going to be tough. So if you would uh, pray for that meeting, I would appreciate it. Also, uh, our missionary, uh, Tom and Laura Requat in Mali, West Africa, uh, they are, for some reason, a lot of their supporting churches and individuals have just quit giving. How would you like to be in Mali, West Africa and see your paycheck drop by about 10 or 12 percent? It's tough. I think they are 93 percent supported right now. And another family name, Frazee, F-R-A-Z-E-E, -E, is that right? Frazee, Frazee. Uh, same situation. And speaking of missions, last Sunday was Fifth Sunday Mission Sunday. And Shirley, what did you say it was for Jessica Murphy that came in? $525 was given for Jessica. That's excellent. Absolutely excellent. And thank you. Thank you for doing that. All right. Any other prayer requests? Pastor. We've got a couple. Uh, Bob Bath continues to go through some tests. We need to uh, pray for Bob. Okay. And then uh, Robin and Dan Griffiths. Robin fell this week, and that's the reason they're not with us this week. She fell, and she's having to recuperate. And Dan's, again, like some of our wounded wing, wingers, is looking at some shoulder surgery before long. So okay, they need our prayers. Robin and Dan Griffiths. Phyllis? Goodness. Okay. Is she still there? Okay. All right. So, uh, and also Tammy. Okay. Yeah. Yucky. Okay. So Luann and Tammy Oppel both need our prayers. John? Okay. 
Okay. And there's lots of people on the road. In case you haven't noticed it, there are people everywhere up here. Tucked away in the forest, on the highway, just, it's unbelievable. Goodness. I know. I know. Yes. Shirley? Okay. Rebecca? Okay. Last name was Ford? Okay. Because Nancy's going to ask. <laughs> Sometimes when it doesn't come in clear on this, I get an email and Nancy says, da 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 da. So, uh, what was the first name? Bill? Yeah. Bill Ford. Got it. Anyone else? Lex? Uh, yes. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. She's just about spent. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Jeremy. Okay, so Nancy, Richard and Karen Johnson, and um, Jody Larson. Any other prayer requests? Jim and I still have a closing request. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. Unspoken requests for the gold shots. Anyone else? Okay, Mary? Let's pray for these prayer requests. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the praises that were shared. Dave Stuckey is uh, doing much better than was ever expected after his stroke. Thank you that the love offering we sent um, to Jessica was $525 extra above our monthly um, support for her. We just uh, lift up a lot of requests. Uh, Jenny's mom, Renee, um, the Requads who have lost support, uh, Robin and Dan Fricker with uh, uh, Robin's fall and Dan's shoulder. We lift up Bob Bath for uh, God's healing as he goes through some more tests. We lift up the Opel's uh, daughters-in-law with medical issues. Uh, Shirley's grandson, Rebecca's cousin, the Whitby's, um, and uh, the Friends of John's that are coming up today, we request your traveling mercies for them. We lift up John Goldshot's unspoken request. You know exactly what it is, and you have the answer. Um, all of the things that were mentioned today, we lift up to you, Lord, because you are the answer no matter what. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you together, all together, church family, those who can, once again. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. I have really enjoyed our streamed service. 
and I know you have too. I praise God that streaming is going to continue, but I have to confess I missed you. <laughs> I think we all realize now more than ever before how important worshiping together really is. I love to hear you sing, uh, but not everyone in America is allowed to sing in church today. Yet we are blessed to be able to Amen. pour our whole heart into worship this morning. Worship is a matter of the heart. So if you are able, please stand and sing with us with all of my heart. With all of my heart, with all of my heart, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart I will give my love to you You're the one who first loved me Through every moment of my life With every breath I breathe With all of my heart With all of my heart I will praise you Lord, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, with all of my heart. I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. I will sing my praise to you. You're the reason for each rhyme. Your spirit captured all of me. Strength and soul and mind with all of my heart. With all of my heart. I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart, with all of my heart, with all of my heart. I will praise you, Lord, with all of my heart. I worship you, Almighty God. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. Oh, worship the king. Oh, worship the king, all glorious above, and gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion. In 
splendor and burden with praise. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail in Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to thee, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures. Here below, praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Bruce Novak has our scripture today. Bruce. Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, or chapter 5, I should say, verses 1 through 13. Give you a minute. Turn there if you want. 5, 1 through 13, John. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred the water. Then whoever stepped in first after stirring the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am uh, coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. And the Jews therefore said to him, who was cursed, it is a Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. You have no idea how good it is to see each and every one of you here this morning. You know, people say it's great because we're a body of Christ, but may I tell you, since I first became acquainted with this church, we are the body of Christ, we're part of it, but we are even more importantly family, family. When I stood up here, and I thank God for the people like John and Jeremy and Peg and so many people, my son and his wife, helping to put this together each week, to come in here and address more or less an empty space. I tell you, it was good, but this is blessed. 
and it blesses me to be back with you again. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to go back to that passage that Bruce just read, John 5. And there are so many rich lessons that we can get out of this one passage. But I'd like to give you four truths that I pray that you will take home and apply to your life. And if you've already got it in your life, fine, share it with somebody else, because these are important truths in this time. You know, there are so many people who hunger for a second chance. Now, I know that you're all perfect, but as being a person who is not perfect and who has made some pretty good blunders in my life, I am a man who appreciates a second chance, a second chance. Now, sometimes people crave that second chance because a hole has been dug for them and they feel like they were dropped in it and they've just been covered over to where their world, their life is full of darkness. There's no hope. The hole is dug by others for us and we allow them to put us in there. Over the years, I've had a chance to counsel with people and they've told me, Tom, since I was a child, people told me that I was worthless that I was an unlovable person, that some people have even told me that their parents say, I wanted you. And literally what those people did was to dig a deep pit and allow themselves to be put in that pit and be covered over. Sometimes it's the fault of others that we would really like to have a second chance. But sometimes, quite frankly, it's because we just make some really Dumb mistakes. Amen? Amen? Now, again, I don't know about you, but I've made them. I've made poor decisions, poor choices. And because of those things, it's caused me and others pain in my life. And there's so many times I wish I could say, God, could we not somehow supernaturally spend hands of time and just start over a do-over, as, as they said in City Slickers? But you know we're so fortunate because the God of creation, the God who we love, the Savior who loves us, is just that. He is a God of second chances. He is not that God who looks for every opportunity to put us down, cast us off, abandon us. The God of the Old and the New Testament, yes, he is a holy God, and yes, he holds us accountable. But even in his holding us accountable, he wants to give us a second chance, a new beginning, a new birth. And for those of us who are Americans, that's part of our culture. Because the American culture, by and large, is a culture of second chances, second birth. If you saw the Republican National Convention, I'm not going to get into politics, but if you happen to see it, one of the nights we were introduced to an African-American man by the name of John Ponder. Did you see the story that, that was told about him? John Ponder was a young man who, quite frankly, messed up his life at an early age. He was raised in New York, which is tough enough. Sorry if you're from New York. <laughs> But he was raised in New York City. He quickly got in gangs. By the time he was 16, he had been arrested for armed robbery. And over the next 20 years, he lived his life in and out of jails. Somehow he got to the West Coast, over into the Nevada area. And while he was high on drugs and drunk, he got involved in a bank robbery that the FBI got involved in. And he was caught, he was arraigned, and he was looking at long prison time because of what he had done. Now, I got to tell you, if you looked at this individual, you'd say, well, why did he deserve a second chance? He continually made the same mistakes over and over. He was caught by an FBI agent who happened to be there at the night of the convention named Rich Beasley. Rich Beasley talks about what he saw in this man named John Ponder. And I'm going to read his words rather than my own. Mr. Beasley described John Ponder like this. He said, when I met John 15 years ago, 
He was a, an angry, he was a scared, he was a bitter black man facing a number of years in prison. One day while we were driving to jail, we had the chance to have a long talk. And you know, we began to understand each other. Five years later, when he got out of prison, John and I met for lunch. And you know, he was a totally different man than the one that I first came to know. He talked about not only his own life being transformed, but how And what he had seen happen to him, he wanted to share that with others and he wanted to start a re-entry program for other male and female contacts, convicts who were experiencing the same type of life he was. He wanted them to have the same chance to start over that he had had. And you know, as he was being introduced to the American public, I don't know about the rest of you, so I had a lump that large in my throat because here was a man who had dug himself such a deep pit many people would have never given him a second chance but the God that we serve gave him a second chance because in his testimony that night he said the reason I'm a different man is because I was introduced to a special person and that special person was Jesus Christ and he said When Jesus came into my life, I didn't just ask him to forgive me and to allow me not to maybe go to the good section of the plane rather than the smoking. But he said, I asked him to transform and make me into a brand new person. That's what second chances really mean. Not just forgiving the past, but going on in life with a new beginning. And that's what Jesus says he wants to give each and every one of us. And that's the basis for our story today. If you have your Bible, I want you to look at it. And I want you to take a look at, again, four important lessons that we can learn. And I just gave you the first. Our God is a God of second chance. If you're following with me, that's what I want you to write down. When you think that God's all done with you, you're wrong. God wants to give you a start over, a new beginning. Now, to understand this passage, I don't want you to start it at the beginning. I want you to start it in verse 14. Because in verse 14, Jesus stops the man after the healing's taken place, and he says, now that you are well, he's been healed, he's picked up his mat, he's walking, Now that you are walked well, stop sinning or something even worse is going to happen to you. Here's what I believe. I believe this in all of my heart. Not all problems in our life come because of sin. There are just bad things in the world. But sometimes when we sin, we bring bad consequences down on ourselves. We bring hurt to our own lives. And I believe that at some point in this man's life, He had sinned in such a way that he became paralyzed. Some people think that it was possibly a sexual sin that caused him, because he had decided to live life on his own terms, possibly a sexual sin had brought on a virus or some type of a malady to where he became paralyzed. And because of that uh, paralysis, he wasn't just a person who couldn't move any longer. He became a person who had to live life begging. And the picture that you get of this person is of a man who is, has become basically worthless to his community, his Jewish synagogue, but most importantly to himself. Now here's the second great truth I want you to see in this lesson. Not only is God a God of second chances, but that he is a God who doesn't look at us as something to be abandoned and something that's worthless. He looks at each of us, no matter what our life has been like, as something that is precious and that he wants to reclaim and redeem. The second chance, but also the idea of being reclaimed and redeemed. 
The last time I spoke two weeks ago, I talked to you about two parables, one about a lost treasure and one about a pearl of great price. And the lesson that was there is, is that out in that field was a treasure that was covered up and buried. And a man went out and found that treasure and he was willing to give everything he had in order to purchase that field to reclaim that treasure that was buried. The other thing it teaches us is that here is this little tiny pearl that is of such great value that the merchant was willing to sell everything he had to purchase that pearl. Now, what does that mean to us? What does it mean concerning this person? We may be feeling like we are buried, that we can't see the light of day, but that there is a God out there who will give everything that he has in order to pull us up and reclaim our lives. He is a God of second chances, but he's also a God who treasures each and every one of us. Take a look to see how far this man had had a hole dug for him in life. Look at John 5, 2. Inside the city, near the sheep gate, was the pool of Bethesda. This isn't probably in your Bible, but the term Bethesda means the house of mercy. With five covered porches and crowds of people, blind, lame, and paralyzed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. I want you to get a picture of this fellow. Can you do that with me for just a second? Consider the environment that this person had existed in for nearly four centuries. Do you realize that he had been paralyzed longer than the Savior had been alive at this time? Jesus was probably about 31, 32 This person had suffered for his mistake longer than Jesus had been alive. And what was his daily life like? I don't know where he went home at night, but I have no doubt where he spent the bulk of his day and the type of people he was around. He went to pools called Bethesda because it was said that there were healing qualities in that pool. And he had been going there regularly, day after day after day, hoping and praying that the water would one day move and he'd be able to get in that water and he would be healed. He would get his what? His second chance. But the trouble is, he's a paralyzed person. And he's getting older and older and the other people around him are younger and younger. And so his chances of getting into that pool and finding healing are getting smaller and smaller. Does that make sense to you? He's feeling more and more hopelessness. And then I think about the type of people that are around him that he has to spend his day with. It says that there were sick people there. Peg, you're a nurse. Are sick people always pleasant to be around? And blind people, and lame people, and paralyzed people. He was around in what Israel would have called the abandoned of Israel. These were the people who, in the eye of the Jewish scholars, would have lived in such sin that they had brought condemnation and curse upon themselves, and there was no second chance available to them. Some people have done paintings of that pool of Bethesda. And I'll tell you, they've sanitized the situation tremendously. How many of you have ever been in a nursing home to do a visit? How many of you have ever been in a poorly run nursing home? I worked around that type of thing when I was trying to get ready to go to college after the military, trying to earn money to go. And I was in a facility one time that I only lasted a short period of time. When you walked in, you were almost knocked to the floor by the smell of urine, fecal material, vomit, all of the other things that come with people who were in total care. That was what the pool of Bethesda was like. All of these sick people, could they find a public toilet? No. Where did they go to the bathroom? Right where they were. Were these the type of people who could go home and throw their clothing in a hot point washing machine? No. These were people who 
their body odor came with them. Their sanitary odors came with them. It would have been a very unpleasant place. When I was working in the nursing home, and I did work at a good facility, and there's night and day between good and bad. But in the bad ones where people are not being attended to, you hear people cry out, help, help. You ever been there before? That's what the pool of Bethesda would have been like. It's not the sanitized picture that we oftentimes see painted. And that's what that man had been around and lived in and among for 38 years. Would you have given up hope over a period of time? Would your spirits have been sky high or would they have been in the tank? That's what this man had gone through. About the person himself for 38 years. He doesn't have somebody who can even get him there. Maybe he borrows somebody to get him there. But would you want to pick him up and carry him to that pool? Would you want to sit next to him in the synagogue worshiping? I really see a picture of an individual here who can barely exist, scraggly hair, bad teeth, emaciated body, atrophied muscles. This is Bethesda. This is where this man without hope is trying to find hope. And after 38 years, I believe that he is in one part of the crowd that's around that pool. I believe he's to the outer perimeter. He doesn't have a chance to get to that pool unless he throws body blocks, which he wasn't able to do for years. But there's one more thing that unless you realize the geography, the geography of the place, it says that Bethesda was near the Sheep Gate. Let me tell you a little bit else about what he lived in day in and day out. Do you know what the Sheep Gate was? It was a hole in the wall that went into Jerusalem where they drove in all of the sheep each day for sacrifice. You ever been around sheep? They don't smell real good. They don't sound real good. So this is the environment that this man had lived in. If you think your life is bad, place yourself in his shoes, or in his case, on his knees. This man was living a hopeless life. Many people would have said, why in the world would anybody want to help such a person like that? Well, because God is the type of God who says, every person deserves a second chance. And there is no wasted human being. You may have counted them out, but I haven't counted them out. That's the type of God we serve. But let's look at the third lesson I'd like you to take. The third lesson is, is that oftentimes when we're feeling in the pit of despair, what do we call out? God, where are you at? Do you even know that I exist? You ever felt that way? God, I'm talking to you and I don't hear anything coming back. Do you even know that I'm here? And if you know that I'm here, do you even care about me? Well, I'd like to have you take a look at verse 6, if you will. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there on his back, and he knew that he had been there for a long time, he said to them, him, do you want to get well again? Again, the third truth. This man, I believe, had thought that God had abandoned him and forgotten him and didn't know his name forever. But here's the truth. I don't care how far you and I have fallen in life. God knows who we are, and God cares about us personally. If you don't believe that, may I give you some passages? Just write these down. I'm sorry, we don't have time, but I will read them to you. Jeremiah, the first chapter, verse 5. God said to the prophet Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. Mary, before you were a zygote, God knew you. Mark, God knew you before you were even brought into your mother's womb. God has been aware of us since the beginning of time. 
Another passage, Isaiah, the 46th chapter, verse 4. God said to Isaiah, I am your God and I will take care of you. And boy, I like these next words. Until you are old and your hair is gray. And for some of us, he said, even if you don't have it. And that's a special blessing for me. Maybe Rob too, I don't know. I made you and I will take care of you and I will give you help and I will rescue you. Does God care about you and me? Listen to what he says in Matthew 6, 25 through 26. Therefore, I tell you, quit being anxious about your life, about what you're eating, what you're going to drink, even about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and body more than clothing? Hey, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more important than any of those birds? If you're saying, can God care about me? I'm saying, are you reading your Bible? And then look at Philippians 4.19. The Apostle Paul said to the Philippian church, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I'm going to repeat that third important point. It's so important. You may feel like God has forgotten you. You may feel like God doesn't know who you are. But here is the assurance of the Bible. I knew you before you were born. I know you now, and I care about you. And it's not me who's keeping the relationship apart. It's you. But let's take a look at one last truth. John, the sixth, fifth chapter, verse six. And this was a truth that was totally foreign to the man that Jesus was healing. John 5, 6, when Jesus saw him, And knew that he had been ill for a long time. He asked him, would you like to get well? He said, I can't, sir, for I have no one to put me in the pool when the water bubbles up. Because somebody else always gets there ahead of me. You know, when Jesus came to that area, the pool at Bethesda, he wasn't sitting there saying, who am I going to heal today? I don't believe that. I believe that he had a targeted mission. You know what I mean? He had punched the button, laser, and this man's name was on the guidance control system. And when he came in and he smelled what he smelled and he saw what he saw and he heard what he heard, his eyes immediately, I believe, went to the outer ring and he said, there's the guy. 38 years caused by his own sin, a man who has given up on life, I'm going to go back to that individual and I'm going to help him. Now, this man shows the state of hopelessness he was in. Jesus says, do you want to get well? Now, I got to tell you, I I wouldn't be flipped with the Lord, but that's a duh. (laughs) I've been laying here for 38 years and you think that this is my resort? This is not my timeshare. I'm here because I need help. I'm here because I want help, but I have no one to help me. I have not a single person who will pick up this emaciated body and get him to where he can find healing. And Jesus doesn't say, I want you to notice this. He didn't say, well, Come on, I'm going to get down here and I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to walk and we're going to stand right by the pool and when it bubbles up, I'm going to toss you in. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to run interference for him. I'm going to out of the way and hold him back until you can get in. Here's the fourth truth I want you to get. The gift of God's forgiveness and grace. And please get this. The gift of God's forgiveness and grace is not a prize you and I have to win. This man thought, in order for me to be healed, I got to beat everybody into the pool, right? That's what his concept of healing was here. I've got to beat other people to get to that pool. 
The gift of God's forgiveness and grace is not a prize to be won, but it's a gift to be received. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to holler out from the ground, hey, I'm a treasure down here. Anybody listening, come by and dig me up. God knew that you were in the hole before. You don't have to call out. God's grace is forgiveness, not a prize to win, but a gift to be received. Jesus says to the man, you want to be healed? Well, yeah, but, no buts, pick up your mat, walk. But I didn't get in the water. Pick up your mat, walk. But there's too many people between me and the water. Pick up your mat, walk, receive the gift. Now, I want you to take away these truths. If you're feeling hurt, if you are feeling any hopelessness or helplessness, listen to those truths one last time before we stop. God is a God of second chances. He wants to give you a second chance. And if you know somebody else, you say, I'm already there. Tom, fine. Share this truth with somebody else. God is a God of second chances. The second thing is, God doesn't care how many mistakes you've made. No, ma- He doesn't care how badly you've messed up. You are never too worthless. You are never too far gone. God sees you as a treasure that he'll pay anything for. And the third thing again, you don't think God knows who you are? Remember, God knew you before you were born. He knows you now, and he wants you to know him. And the last thing, again, you don't have to fight for salvation. You don't have to fight to get past other and win a prize. His grace is a gift. Isn't that a great God? It's a whole lot different in our culture, right? Because everybody has to deserve, everybody has to win. Not in God's kingdom. It's there for us to receive. Would you bow with me? Father... This morning, there are so many people fighting despair and hopelessness, even in churches. I know that because I have people at times call me and say, Tom, I'm struggling. That's okay because I've struggled too, Lord. But thank you, Father, for these truths, these truths that you love us more than we could ever know and that you're aware of who we are even to the number of hairs on our head. Father, if there is somebody here this morning who is fighting despair, I pray that these words would sink deep in their heart and say, I don't have to listen to the lives of Satan anymore. I have a God who wants me. Nobody else may want me, but I have a God who wants me, and I want him. And Father, if there are people that we know of who need this truth, let's not be silent about it. Make us bold and give them this truth message of grace and truth. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The greatest proof of everything I said this morning occurred on a cross at a place called Calvary. Jesus died for us, but Phyllis... Jesus never said, when you get good enough, I'll give you an opportunity. He never said that. Amen? He never said that when you learn enough of the Bible, you can become part of my family. We'll get you a degree. Nothing to earn. Everything to receive. And that's what we're going to celebrate in just a moment. If you are a child of God... We're going to have family business right now. We're going to thank our father, our older brother, for the truths that we heard this morning. I'm going to ask Bruce and Bob if they would come. And I'm going to ask a favor of each of you while they're passing the cup, the bread's on the bottom. I'd like you to talk to God this morning and say, Lord, here's where I'm at. 
here's where I'm at. I want to say thank you, but here's some things I'm dealing with. Examine yourself and have some quiet time with the Father in this most precious of moments. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was brought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In the bottom cup, you'll find a piece of bread, unleavened bread. Jesus said that this represents to us his body, his body. You and I can't even imagine the pain that Jesus went through on the cross, the physical pain. We can't even imagine. The actor who played Jesus in the Mel Gibson film, they had a special piece of material around his back he was being whipped and he said one time one of the lashes went around the side and hooked me and he said I almost passed out with the pain just a little bit of it Jesus got the full amount of that because he did something wrong no do you remember what I just said because there was a treasure that needed to be purchased a price that needed to be paid a treasure that needed to be redeemed look in the mirror You is it. You is it. Can we say thank you to God and how much we appreciate it? Father, this bread, thank you so much. We don't deserve this. but We appreciate it more than you could ever know. Help us, Father, to never forget, never take for granted, never spurn the wonderful gift that we have received and didn't have to earn in Jesus name amen take the bread please the cup I keep thinking this morning about the prodigal son the kid who went out and messed up need a second chance right I know some fathers who would have said kiddo you made your bed now go lay in it Forget it. Don't come home. That's not the type of God we serve. That was a God of second chances. Even though his brother wanted it. Remember him, the older brother? But the father says, no. I am so happy to have him home. Let's celebrate. Heavenly Father, this morning, as we take the cup, remembering the blood that was shed, but now the blood that courses through our veins, common in the spirit. Thank you so much. May we never forget in Jesus' name. Amen. Do we serve an awesome God? Do we have a wonderful God? Let's go out with a song. Let's go out and praise him. But will you do me a favor? This world needs Jesus. I have never seen America at such a time of despair and hopelessness as I do right now. And this election isn't going to fix it. I'm sorry. God is in control. God's in control. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats. God is in control. So if we want to do something powerful, let's give the world the hope of Jesus, the truth of Jesus. Because it's only when we transform this nation from the inside out that anything's going to change. That's your prayers and mine. Let's go up, stand and sing the praises we have of God. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. 
Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that's in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Over the coming weeks, we are going to be talking about new beginnings. New beginnings as a congregation, new beginnings as individuals, hopefully new beginnings as a nation. You may think that you are insignificant. May I tell you something? I've been studying the history of revivals for a long time. Revivals don't start in the mega churches. They usually start in small congregations because God tends to take that which appears to be weak to do the strong purposes that he has. Do you believe that? Yeah. Not podunk, NBC. We are God's family here, and God will use us if we'll but give ourselves to him. Go in God's grace, go in his peace, and go in his love. In Jesus' name, amen.